Well, hello everybody. Um, in this video, we're going to talk about possible mechanisms, possible tactics to protect the Earth from an asteroid or comet that, that's heading our way. Uh, uh, periodically we get hit, in fact we get hit by small things every day, and once in a while we get hit by something larger. Just a few years ago, uh, the Chelyabinsk meteor, which was about 20 meters in diameter, had an impact of about 400 kilotons equivalent. And 66 million years ago, we had the uh, Chicxulub impactor, which is believed to have had some role in killing off the dinosaurs, and that was about 11 kilometers in diameter, thereabouts, possibly larger if it was a, a, a comet, but the energy of that impact is roughly 13,000 times the entire arsenal of the world's nuclear weapons. 13,000 times that. So, um, we do have to consider possible means of protecting us because sooner or later we are going to get hit. Among the uh, techniques that have been discussed, one of the ones that seems to have gotten the most traction, or among the most traction, is the idea of using a gravity tug. That is, positioning a spacecraft close to the asteroid or comet, and then using the mutual gravity between them to pull the asteroid from its intended path so that it actually misses Earth. In this video, we're going to discuss uh, that problem and how viable it is. So stay tuned and we'll go into this in greater detail using some mathematics that I'll try to explain to you so it'll be understandable. And um, in the end, I think you'll come to the conclusion that uh, this is not the solution we're looking for. We need we need other solutions. So uh, stay tuned for the uh, details here on the gravity tug. Thank you. Okay, so the, the first equation we're going to look at here is the, uh, the, the equation for universal gravitation. And it's uh, defined as F1 equals F2, the forces acting between the masses. And they're equal to big G, the universal gravitational constant, times the quantity, m1 times m2, all divided by r squared. So the two masses and the radius is the distance between the center of mass and the center of mass, not the surface to the surface, it's from the center to the center. Okay, so that's the, the uh, uh, form of the equation. It's just a very simple equation. There's nothing terribly complicated about it. So if we look at our example here, I've chosen a value of the mass equal to Earth and a value of the radius equal to Earth and as my second mass I'm setting that equal to one, just one kilogram. And that results in a gravitational attraction of 9.8 newtons, exactly what you would expect, and the ratio to Earth's g is one. There's a little bit of a rounding issue here, um, but in any case that's that's what we're getting. So if I was to change um, the uh, mass 1 to, say, the moon. So I'll change that to the value of the moon. I also have to change the radius because moon is a, sh a smaller radius, right? So let's change that to the radius of the moon. And there we go. So the 1 kilogram mass 2 now weighs 1.62 uh, newtons. That's its uh, the force, gravitational attraction, and the uh, kilograms force equivalent is 0.165. Uh, that's 1.65 times 10 to the minus 1, or 0.165. And again, the ratio to Earth is also 0.165. So that's. Um, how the equation works. It's, again, very simple. Nothing uh, terribly elaborate, no calculus, nothing 
Basically, you take the universal gravitational constant, which is this, this value here. Uh, it's an expressed in scientific notation because it's a you know small value, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. That's a pretty small value. If I come up here and click on it, you'll see in the uh, formula bar, that's like a lot of zeros before you get to the first six. In any case, um, it, a very simple equation, uh, but this is critically important because it, when you're trying to attract a asteroid or comet with your gravitational tug, the only forces that you're having uh, working with, the only forces that you can use to move or accelerate the, the object is gravity. So knowing what, what that gravitational attraction is, is pretty important. So let's try uh, some other numbers here. Let's look at the Chelyabinsk meteor. So we'll try the mass for that. Control C, V, and we need to, the radius for the Chelyabinsk uh, meteor, and that was listed as 10 meters. So uh, the radius equation, uh, uh, ta I'm sorry, column here is listed in kilometers, so that's 0 0.01 kilometers or 10 meters. All right, so you don't really see that. I have to do that. Okay, so with Chelyabinsk meteor being the mass one and a one kilogram um, mass sitting on the surface of uh, the meteor, what would the gravitational attraction be? And it would be pretty small, only about one millionth or eight millionths of a Newton, pretty small. Ratio to Earth, very small. So you don't have a lot of gravity, um, a lot of force there, and even if you increase the, the mass too, to let's say uh, 10,000 kilograms, the force, the mutual attraction is still a small fraction of one Newton, about eight hundredths, about point, point 0.1 Newton, pretty small. Now let's Let's try another one here. We'll use this bottom box here and we'll go with uh, the asteroid Bennu. It has a, a mass of 7.8 times 10 to the 10, which I have there, and a radius of 0.265, sorry, 0.2625 uh, kilometers, 262 meters, which I have there. And if I take the mass of well, mass 2 equal to what a semi-truck weighs, which is roughly about 35,000 kilograms. It weighs 2.6 newtons, or about 260 grams force on the asteroid Bennu. And Bennu is, you know, a reasonably large object. All right, so that's the um, the rocket equation, and you'll see I have um, some links here for data. Uh, I'm showing here in the orange that um, these are calculated estimates, um, and the red is data that I, I, I seems to me to be uh, pretty suspect. Um, but in any case, the um, these are the values that I was able to find for it, and uh, the next step. We want to look at the, the second formula that's important here, and that's the rocket equation. So let's go to that. So here's the rocket equation. Um, the general form of that is delta V, the change in velocity of the spacecraft, is equal to the ISP times G0 times the natural log, natural log of the initial mass divided by the final mass. That can be re-expressed in the equivalent form of delta V equals V sub E times the natural log of MI over MF. So really the difference is that VE equals ISP times G0. So um, that's the general form of the equation for um, 
the rocket equation, uh, but you can rearrange the terms to express it in a different way. For example, delta V divided by VE equals the natural log of MI over MF. Therefore, MI over MF is equal to E, which is the, the base of natural logarithms, approximately 2.7, E to the delta V over VE power. And rearranging still further, the MI, the initial mass, is therefore equal to the final mass times E to the delta V over VE. This is the form of the equation that we're going to be using later on. And it allows us to, working backwards from the, the payload as it arrives on station, um, and figuring out what the mass of the stage that does that is, and then, again, working backwards what the stage before that has to be, all the way back to where we are, where we need to be to, be, um, to launch from Earth. So let's throw some values in here. In this particular example, I'm going to be calculating what delta V is by changing some of these parameters. At the moment, I have the initial mass at 40,000 kilograms, the final mass at um, 10,000 kilograms, and an ISP of 452, which is about where the Hydrolox, a hydrogen-based um, rocket motor, would be in vacuum. So that results in a uh, V sub E, or exhaust velocity, of approximately 44,000, I'm sorry, 4,433, and a delta V for those parameters of something over 6,000 meters per second. If I was to change the delta V, I'm sorry, the ISP, to say 295, which would be more in the line of a hypergolic engine, you could see that the delta V for the same uh, initial and final mass is a lot less. It's not as efficient as a Hydrolox engine. All right, so that kind of gives you an idea of the effects uh, there. But now, as I said, I, we're, later on we're going to be uh, working the um, calculation of the, uh, the, the rocket necessary to get to a, an asteroid or comet, an object, working that you know backwards because that's kind of what you have to do, and using this particular form of the equation to do that. So with this box here, and that's how we kind of had it set up. If I have the initial mass, or final mass, at um, 15,000 kilograms, if I specify a delta V of 4,000, that's how much I want to change the, the, um, the, uh, the delta V of the rock, of that particular stage, uh, and an ISP of 300. That results in an initial mass for that stage of something over 58,000 kilograms. If I was to change the ISP to where a Hydrolox engine would be of say 452, watch the initial mass. That will drop. It dropped down to 36,981. So that's kind of the form of the, um, the, the two equations. They're, both of them are quite simple. The mathematics for uh, rearranging the ter terms and um, converting that using uh, E, getting rid of the natural log per se, that's a little bit more advanced than, you know, maybe a high school algebra, but it's not terribly difficult. Um, I'm not going to spend the time to go into that now, but in bottom line is these are the forms of the equation. And this is the one that we're going to be using later on, um, but this is the root form, uh, and as you'll see in um, any, any text on it, the general form, and this is often the one that's used um, simplifying because VE is equal to ISP times G0. So now let's go to an example of a three-stage rocket, and what better example than the Saturn V? So uh, the Saturn V rocket had sort of two different missions that it did. Uh, obviously the most important one was sending um, astronauts to the moon. And to do that, uh, the um, rocket would boost the uh, moon mission equipment 
to escape velocity, which is something around about 12 kilometers per second. And to do that, um, the maximum payload that the Saturn V could boost to escape velocity was about 35,000 kilograms. It had a second mission, though, where it would lift something like the Space Lab, which was boosted to low Earth orbit, so it didn't have to get to escape velocity, and therefore the mass that it could boost to low Earth orbit was much higher than what would be sent to the Moon. So the payload for that is listed as 140,000 kilograms. And just to be clear, it's not clear to me that that mass includes the mass of the third stage structure, the empty mass of the third stage structure, um, though um, it seems like it kind of has to. If somebody knows for sure, uh, please uh, respond in the comments. In any case, using that as the final mass, and remember we're using this form of the equation where we're starting with a final mass, in this case stage three, and working backwards to figure out what the initial mass of stage one is, and then knowing what the initial stage mass of stage one is, and add, adding the mass of the empty structure for stage two, I know what the final mass of stage two is, and then I can work backwards in, in uh, from stage two to stage one to the point where we know what the initial mass of the entire rocket is, which is showing here as 2.98 million kilograms, which is right in line with what the rocket actually weighed. So, and I'm showing here the, the ratio of the Saturn V fully assembled Saturn V rocket, and that's right at 1.0, so it's equal exactly to the um, the weight, the mass of the Saturn V as it actually existed. There is some dithering around this number a little bit. Um, they, they Some uprated the uh, engines a little bit from some of the later flights. But, uh, and, and again, one of the problems I, I have here is that there's some differences in, in the data as you're looking from various sources. One place lists something as this, another one listed as that. So there's some differences in knowing for sure what the actual values are is a little bit um, hard to know. One of the things that I kind of need to explain here and Let's kind of go over that now. So delta V is an important thing, and basically each stage of a rocket is designed to provide a certain amount of delta V. And that's what's listed here in this column called delta V, obvious enough. And this data is pulled right from um, one of the graphs that I have from, from NASA. The uh, first stage of the Saturn V rocket provided a delta V of 2,756 meters per second. However, that first stage has to fight gravity a lot. It's taking off vertically, and that first uh, bit of uh, the flight, it's fighting gravity, but it's also fighting aerodynamic drag. So there's additional uh, propulsion re for requirements to account for what they refer to as aerodynamic drag, simple enough, and also what they refer to as gravity drag. So that's what I'm showing here as additional delta V. So it's not really delta V in the sense that the rocket's going faster. It's uh, sort of the uh, effective additional fuel and, and such required to overcome gravity drag and aerodynamic drag. So the first stage is going to have the lion's share of that gravity drag and, um, and atmospheric drag which is I'm showing here. The second stage um, is much less. Uh, the, it's flying more horizontal than vertically, so its gravity drag is much less, and it's flying in much, much thinner atmosphere, so its atmospheric drag is much less. And we're finally, when we get to the third stage, um, there's very little gravity drag and very little atmospheric drag, very little. So uh, these, again, I have to confess, are approximations that I've come up with, 
And when you look at the calculations for the total delta V, I'm showing that as 7,800 meters per second, 7.8 kilometers per second is in fact what the general uh, accepted value for uh, the velocity necessary for low Earth orbit is. But adding the additional delta V to overcome the gravity drag and uh, atmospheric drag results in an effective delta V shown here totaling about 9,000, 8,900 and it varies somewhat. So again, these are approximations and I'm using as the ISP the actual values um, listed for for that. Um, the ISP for the second and third stages are uh, for the Hydrolox engines, the J2 engines, and since both of them are working in more or less vacuum, uh, the ISP is at its highest. The ISP of the um, F1 engine at sea level is less than 276, but the F1 engine doesn't stay at sea level for the entire flight. In fact, the average, time-weighted average elevation or altitude of the first stage is about 12 kilometers thereabouts, and the air pressure difference is sufficient to increase the ISP a little bit. It's not going to go to a full vacuum, uh, even if it wasn't vacuum, because the uh, nozzle is not designed for that level of expansion. Um, but the ISP is going to tend to increase as the pressure decreases. So I'm using, uh, again, I have to confess, a, a, um, a ballpark number I'm, I'm approximating, but I think that should be pretty reasonable for the F1 RP1 engine at its a time-weighted average altitude of approximately 12 kilometers. So that's the, um, the rocket equation uh, as applied to the Saturn V. Uh, the next step we're going to talk about is the direct mission to intercept an incoming asteroid or comet object from Earth, and I say direct mission, as opposed to using gravitational assist to get there. If you have a short notice mission and you don't have the time to take advantage of the gravity assist, then you're going to have to try to fly a more direct flight to it. And we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. Okay, so th this is where we get to the meat of the issue, the problem. We're assuming now um, we, we need to intercept an incoming asteroid or comet object and we have uh, short notice. We can't make use of gravity assist. This is, would be a direct flight, direct mission profile launching from the Earth and heading um, as directly as possible to the asteroid for intercepting it in the quick, shortest period of time so that we uh, have some opportunity to deflect the um, object. Again, working like we did with the Saturn V, a three-stage rocket example, we're starting with um, the final stage. We're starting at the end and working backwards. So with an initial mass, or sorry, a final mass, the ma mass of the rocket system the gravity tug as it arrives on station at the asteroid of 5,000 kilograms and with a 4,000 uh, meters per second delta V for the final stage using Hydrolox engines, our base, best case example for ISP, that would result in a initial mass of, of 12,000 um, uh, kilograms. And then to calculate what the final mass of the stage eight would be, I take that weight and I multiply it by 1.2. That 1.2 is equal to, the one is equal to this mass, and 0 0.2, I'm assuming, this isn't a sum, sum value, I don't have any values I can pull off the shelf for this, this is a hypothetical rocket, right? So I'm assuming that the mass of the empty stage eight is equal to about 20% of the rest of the rocket. And I use that same 20% for all of the stages. So 
These are an approximation, uh, but it's a reasonable one, I think, because with the Saturn V, the empty um, stage, the mass of that was equal to about 23 to 25% of the, um, the final stage, the next stage. So um, that's how I calculate it. So we're again starting at um, the, the end with the final mass of 5,000 kilograms and using the ISP and delta Vs as shown here and working backwards using this form of the equation, we get these values that ripple upwards. And as you can see, with these values, a nine stage rocket, a total a delta V of 36 kilometers per second, the mass of the rocket on the launch pad would be 88 million kilograms or 29.6 times the mass of the fully loaded Saturn V on the launch pad. That would require about 148 F1 engines equivalent. Okay, so I'm telling you this is the best case, assuming every stage had the highest ISP possible using hydrolux hydrogen and oxygen. Now, 36 kilometers per second, where did I get that? Well, this is also an approximation, but let's see how I came to that. The first three stages are going to get you off of Earth, into Earth's atmosphere, and past Earth through um, escape velocity, which is approximately 12 kilometers per second. So that's 4 plus 4 plus 4, 12 kilometers per second. I've just kind of conveniently divided the delta Vs into 4,000 increments per stage. Um, it could be, it could vary somewhat around there. Um, but in any case, um, 12 kilometers per second would get you escape velocity and heading out towards intercepting the object. But the other, the object is coming inbound in the other direction at approximately 12 kilometers per second. It could be a little bit less than 12, or it could be considerably more than 12. So I think 12 is a reasonable uh, ballpark number for the inbound velocity of the object. So we're going outbound at 12 kilometers per second, and it's coming inbound at 12 kilometers per, se per second. That's a difference of 24 kilometers per second. That's what this is. So First three stages get you outbound. The next three stages zero out your outbound velocity. Then the final three stages bring you up to the inbound velocity of the object. So that's where we get to 36 kilometers per second. And in reality, it would be higher than that effectively because I'm not here showing you what, uh, what the effect of gravity drag and uh, atmospheric drag would be so we would really have to add one to one and a half or so kilometers per second for uh, the first three stages to account for that um, and then of course the inbound velocity of the um, asteroid or comet could be higher than 12 kilometers per second so I think again 36 kilometers per second is a not unreasonable um, total delta V and this is where we get the problem that much delta V um, is really impossible. It's simply impossible. You're looking at a relatively small final payload. You would really want it to be much higher, much heavier than that. But if we double the mass here, we, we wind up doubling the initial mass as well. So that um, that's not really feasible. We're already 29.6 times the mass of the Saturn V. And it gets worse than that. Hydrolux is not really an appropriate fuel for long-term uh, storage. Remember, uh, some of these engines, particularly stages four through nine, they're not going to be fired, off, fired for about a year, maybe more. So we're gonna take off, burn through the first three stages, and then we're gonna be coasting outbound for a year or more before we fire stage four. And you know the storage temperature of liquid hydrogen is around about 20 degrees uh, Kelvin. 
that's a really difficult problem, and it makes long-term storage of cryogenic hydrogen at this point um, not possible. So the ISP I'm showing you here is our best case scenario. Let's take the next best case scenario, which is kind of coming on board now, and that's um, methane. So let's look at that. I'm using kind of like the Raptor engine uh, ISP values. So let's try those ISPs and see what we, we get. It's, again, assuming a, a, a payload to, um, to the asteroid or comet of 5,000 kilograms. And initially, 29.5 times the ratio of the Saturn V. So let's go ahead and change the ISPs to methane. And doing that change alone, which seems relatively small, increased the total mass of the rocket on, on the launch pad to almost 388 million kilograms, or the equivalent of 129.8 times the mass of a fully loaded Saturn V. So just changing from the ISP of, met, uh, of hydrogen to the ISP of methane increased the total mass of the rocket by 100 times the mass of the fully loaded Saturn V. And if we were using F1 engines, which we wouldn't with hydrogen, I'm sorry, methane, but if we were using F1 engines, the, the thrust capability of an F1 engine, we would need 649 of them to provide the thrust to do, for, and that's just for stage one. That's just for stage one. For stage two, we would need another 163 of them, etc. So, uh, lowering the ISP from Hydrolux to uh, methane dramatically increased the mass of the, uh, the rocket, changing nothing else. Let's see what happens when we go down to Hypergolix, which would probably be the most likely fuel, maybe not for the first couple of stages, but let's just go with this. So if we put in the values for Hypergolix, <laughs> now we're up to 416 times the mass of the Saturn V and 1.25 billion kilograms. Again, having changed nothing else about the total delta V or the final mass. That would require on stage one alone 2,080 F1 engines. And it gets worse than that. Let's try RP-1. These are engines um, of like the F-1 variety. So the ISPs for that. Look at that. We're at 3.2 billion pa uh, kilograms and a ratio to the Saturn V of 1,075. We would need 5,375 F1 engines in just the first stage. Now, let's be clear here. This is not possible. We couldn't build a rocket that big. We couldn't build a rocket 30 times the mass of the Saturn V, let alone 1,075 times the mass of the Saturn V. But it's even more complicated than that. Even assuming we could physically build it, the acoustic energy produced by 5,375 F1 engine equivalents would be so enormous that it would destroy the rocket and probably everything within three or four kilometers. Simply destroy it by the acoustic energy alone. I don't care what kind of sound suppression you have there. That acoustic energy would be so enormous it would destroy everything. And that's true whether or not we're using these lowest uh, case ISP, or let's try go back to the Hydrolux, which would be the highest case ISP. 148 F1 engines would, the acoustic energy from that would be so enormous, it would destroy the rocket and everything within a couple of uh, kilometers. That kind of energy is beyond any scale we have uh, 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 any hope of grasping. That kind of energy, we're talking 
tens of millions of horsepower. Tens, well, hundreds of millions of horsepower. It's, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me check on that because I think it could actually be in the billions of horsepower. Bottom line is, um, even with our best case fuel, which we couldn't actually use because of the long-term storage requirements, we're at more than 30 times, or almost 30 times the mass of the Saturn V on the launch pad, which is bigger than we could even remotely hope to build, and the acoustic energy would destroy it anyway. So doing a direct mission to intercept an asteroid or comet with a gravity tug is not possible. It's impossible. Um, that isn't to say we couldn't get a tug to an asteroid, but it would require the use of gravity assist, and that would require we ha have sufficient notice that we could plan a mission possibly more than a decade into the future. So, um, a direct mission using a gravity for, for a gravity assist is not going to work. The total delta V is too much. The total mass would be too much. All right. So let's assume, let's assume we do have enough time and that we can use a gravity assist to get there. What effectiveness would a gravity tug have if it actually got there? Would it actually do the job? Let's go to that tab. Okay, so uh, this is the final tab uh, that we're going to look at. And, and in this tab, we're looking at what the actual effect the gravity tug would have if it was somehow able to get to the asteroid or comet, the object, and do so over a certain period of time. And again, we're restating here the formula here for the universal gravitation uh, calculation. Force is equal to G times the quantity M1 times M2 divided by R squared. All right, and uh, we'll be looking at these other forms of the force and acceleration equations in a little bit. So um, let's take a look at one possible example of a very small object, a fairly small object, 25 meters in diameter, and two grams per cubic centimeter. That size object, and presumably, we're, we're, we're going to base this on the assumption that it's a perfectly spherical object, which is, in fact, not likely to be the case for an object this small. But let's assume that it's a perfectly spherical object, and that we're maintaining a standoff distance of 10 meters. You don't want to hit it. So an object of that size and mass would, and with a standoff distance resulting in a net radius of 22.5 meters, result in a gravitational attraction of about 1 20th of a Newton. A 1 20th of a Newton. That's a small number. And that results in a very small acceleration. But if we're operating for three years, if we have the opportunity to, to uh, get the, the gravity tug there and have three years of time to move it into a, you know, uh, away from its current path, we could, in fact, cause a displacement of 14,770 kilometers, which would be more than enough to avoid hitting Earth. But that's a pretty small object. What if we went to 50 meters? Just a change to 50 meters, and again, that's not a terribly huge object. Now the displacement after three years' time is 6,100 kilometers. That's less than enough to ensure that it doesn't hit Earth. Now, it might well be enough, given the fact that the object might not have been a, uh, a bullseye, direct bullseye on Earth uh, from its original trajectory, so it might not have had to deflect it by 
one Earth radius to avoid hitting. But, you know, obviously at 50 meters diameter, we're getting to the point where um, our confidence in being able to deflect that asteroid or comet in three years is pretty low. And if we go to 100 meters, three years isn't enough. In three years, we'll have only deflected about 2,077 kilometers, 33% of Earth's radius. So the odds that this arrangement of an object of only 100 meters in diameter in three continuous years of gravity tugging, that would not be sufficient to deflect that object sufficiently. Um, now we're going to come over here and look at the uh, fuel equation because for, an, for a gravity tug to maintain station keeping about this object for three years, it's going to have to um, pulse its thrusters in order to do that. And this is a calculation here based on uh, uh, a pretty high ISP for hypergolic fuels and the total number of um, newton seconds of fuel uh, of um, thrust required over three years to maintain uh, the the uh, station keeping that would result in a amount of fuel consumed of 14,152 kilograms of fuel. Now, if we assume that the mass upon arrival of the tug was 25,000 kilograms, that would reduce the mass after three years down to about, uh, you know, 11,000 kilograms, give or take. Now, that's a perfectly possible scenario, except <laughs> the thrusters would be operating for a very long total time period, cumulative operation period, very likely in the many thousands of hours. Now, that type of duration is not likely to be viable for any of the um, fuel-based rocket engines that we now have. Generally speaking, uh, rocket engines seldom burn cumulatively, cumulatively over their entire lifetime more than about 15 minutes. Now, we're be, we, 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 <laughs> we would certainly be talking in the, in the order, on the order of thousands of hours and conceivably more than 10,000 hours. Um, so erosion of the throat, of, of the rocket nozzle, of the combustion chamber, of the injectors, all of that would seem to me to um, make it very unlikely that a rocket motor would be able to survive that long. The alternative would be, for example, a, an ion propulsion system, which is in fact viable, uh, except um, ion thrusters require a, an enormous amount of electrical power. Um, for the, this kind of arrangement, we'd probably be talking in the vicinity of several kilowatts and likely more than that. And to do this in a deep space probe arrangement where we don't have access to uh, sufficient sunlight to generate solar power, we would have to bring our power with us, our energy with us. And uh, the most commonly used method for doing that today is RTGs, radioisotope thermoelectric generators, but they're typically limited to about 150 to 250 watts of power. So getting in the order of kilowatts or even tens of kilowatts would seem to be require tens or even 30 or 40 of these RTGs, which seems unlikely. And let's, let's go a little bit further. So we're at a 100 meter object and that's obviously not going to be, um, the tug of 25,000 kilograms is not going to be enough to deflect it. Even if we go to 50,000 kilograms, 
still not enough, and 50,000 kilograms would be beyond what we could launch out of Earth's orbit, you know, escape velocity, with any booster that we have. Even going back to Saturn V, which would be the largest booster we've ever used to launch uh, payloads into space, that would have been limited to about 35,000 kilograms uh, for uh, escape velocity, uh, roughly 11 or 12 um, kilometers per second. So um, 50,000 kilom uh, kilograms isn't going to be enough for a 100 meter object. And 50,000 kilograms is more than that tug could possibly be to get there. Even if we assume we got almost all of the delta V beyond escape velocity through um, gravity assist. So let's put that back to 25,000, which I would argue is probably the high end of what would be really more likely. And again, 100 meters is not doable. But well, let's go back to where we started, 25 meters. Hey, that works, right? We're at 14,000 kilometers. That would work. But here's the problem. Even at a, something in a, as small as 25 um, meters in diameter and three years of uh, operation, while it seems like it works, that's on the presumption that this is a spherical object where the um, net radius is a you know a reasonable value. If it's a, a an oblong object, and almost certainly it will be, think Ultima Thule, you might have to have a standoff, a net standoff distance um, of 25 meters or more. And <laughs> That simple change uh, changed our, our, our effectiveness from 14,000 kilometers, which would definitely miss Earth, to 5,300 kilometers, which might not, in fact, probably would not miss Earth. So even if these very small objects Our ability to deflect them is sufficiently is highly suspect, even after three years of effort. And if we get to the larger objects, and let me um, control Z, let me um, make that say 1,000 meters, which is certainly a, a possible object. The uh, the object that hit Earth 66 million years ago and was at least partially responsible for destroying or killing off the dinosaurs, that was uh, 11 kilometers or larger, depending on if or whether it was an asteroid or a comet. So that was at least 11 kilometers, more than 11 times this size or more than a thousand times more massive. So let's go back, let's go to a thousand meters uh, and we'll, we'll keep it at two grams per cubic centimeter. It could well be greater than that. It could be less than that. But at a thousand meters diameter, our deflection in three years time with a 25,000 kilogram tug and a 10 meter standoff distance is 29 kilometers less than one-half percent of Earth's radius. That's not going to do it, folks. That's not going to do it. Another problem is fuel. In order, just looking, looking at this particular example, a 1,000 meter diameter object, two grams per cubic centimeter, and a 25,000 kilogram tug. Let's step over here. In three years, with the same force requirements, these are the cumulative newton seconds required, and that's the fuel required. 196,000 kilograms. 
many times the mass of the tug, on the order of eight times the mass of the tug. Obviously not possible. So, even, even if we had the effectiveness sufficient, we wouldn't have the fuel to do it. Two hundred and fifty meters were over forty three thousand kilograms, which is roughly double the mass of the tug as it arrived, so that wouldn't be possible. A hundred meters. Okay, so um even at one hundred meters, which is not a terribly big object. After three years of operation, we're still only about 33% of the Earth's radius displacement, which is not likely to be adequate. Um, it would have only consumed about 14,000 kilograms of fuel, so the quantity of fuel would be sufficient. It, it still begs the question of whether we could have it, a rocket motor or series of rocket motors survive for the thousands of hours of operation they would need to um, survive. And the other problem, of course, is that we're, we're assuming a spherical object with uniform dimensions so that we can maintain the minimum standoff distance and net radius. If in a more realistic world, and again, think about Ultimate Thule, Ultima Thule, where it's four or five times as long as it is wide, um, the net radius would likely have to be substantially larger. Um, and even go, go down to a, a 50 meter diameter object, which is still insufficient to ensure not hitting the Earth. And we go down to a 25 meter object, where again, it is sufficient, assuming a spherical object. If But if we're not spherical, if we have a standoff distance uh, an average standoff distance that has to be 15 meters, just 15 meters further, call it 25, and now we're not, we're not confident we're going to avoid hitting the Earth. In fact, um, it, it's very possible that it will hit the Earth, even at that. So even an object 25 meters in diameter and um, it, it is suspect. Getting there in a direct mission where we don't make use of gravity assist is impossible. It's not almost impossible, it's absolutely impossible. The delta V required is too great. The mass on launching would be overwhelmingly too great, too high, and the acoustic energy of such a large rocket would destroy itself and everything within kilometers. So a direct mission isn't going to do it. The only way we're going to get there would be to make use of gravity assist. And for that to work, we would have to have the planets in the right position. And the odds of that are not really that good. I would argue that this plan of using a gravity tug to save our ass is non-viable for all but the very smallest objects many of which would burn up in the atmosphere anyway or otherwise do very little damage. So this concept, I think, is invalid. Now, there are some other methods uh, that are have been discussed for dealing with an inbound uh, Earth-impacting uh, asteroid or comet. And over the next uh, months or so, I would like to perhaps uh, explore a few of the other possibilities and see how they fly with uh, the mathematics. Um, and that's one of the things that you know I kind of wanted to do with this video is lay out the mathematics so that everyone can see what's going on, and then you know using a spreadsheet like this where you can you know adjust the numbers and see what what the results are you can see for yourself. Again, in this example, it shows that the gravity tug is non-viable, with the exception of a few of the very smallest cases, if 
if the planets lined up appropriately so that a gravity assist could be used. So, um, in the future, in the near future, I'd like to discuss perhaps uh, the uh, um, kinetic impactor as one of the uh, possible solutions, as well as the two basic concepts involving nukes. One, blowing the object up, and the other, which most people who have actually studied it seem to believe is the preferred solution, and that is to use a nuclear uh, explosion at a standoff distance so that you do not actually blow the object up. In any case, uh, over the over the um, next uh, few months, I hope to be able to um, delve into that a little more deeply, and so we'll explore some of the other possibilities. But I do hope that people can see here that this idea of using a gravity tug is non-viable. All right, so um, I appreciate everybody watching, and uh, thank you very much.